All right, we're going to pick up our study in the 8th chapter of Acts, uh, chapter 8, verses 25 through 40. And um, we have, we have uh, just finished up um, in the uh, first section here. We've noticed that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And we've uh, given you at the end of the last session probably the greatest illustration of that in Scripture it takes us all the way back into the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 50, where uh, Joseph announces to his brethren who betrayed him many, many years before. And, uh, of course, they're very hesitant. They're not sure how Joseph is going to treat them if it's going to be with kindness or vengeance. And uh, sensing their fears, he assures them of his positive attitude toward them, recognizing that God used their evil decision uh, for good, ultimately for the preservation of their family and for the preservation of the, really, of the 12 tribes of Israel. We noted that uh, the uh, church has endured persecution. The stoning of Stephen at the end of chapter number 7. Persecution continues, and we see that the, uh, the disciples are leaving, not the apostles per se, but disciples are leaving Jerusalem, and uh, Judea and Samaria now are, are being uh, dealt with. They're receiving the uh, truth of God's Word, and um, uh, we're not uh, we have been introduced to Saul, who is the Apostle Paul, who by the time we get to chapter number 13, Paul is going to be prepared to take the gospel then, along with his companion Barnabas, to the uttermost part of the earth. But we're going to look here in a, at another evangelist, um, one of the deacons mentioned back in chapter 6, as Stephen was, we see his story in chapter 7. Here in chapter 8, we see the story of Philip, uh, the evangelist, or Philip, the deacon, assuming that these are the same individuals. They may not be. That's possible. But assuming that they're the same, nonetheless, we get the story of a man named Philip. And uh, we pick up in... Uh, in uh, the second paragraph under the introduction, the early verses of Acts 8 chronicle Philip's trip to Samaria. Philip takes the word of God, the good news of the gospel, to a people who have been estranged from the Jews for a long period of time. The Samaritans were considered half-breeds. They chose not to fully embrace the historic Jewish religion, and the disagreements in theology and assorted history created a deep animosity, the one for the other. Now, after moving north, that's the direction, to the Samaritans in Acts chapter 8, Philip is led south to Gaza, where he encounters a Jewish proselyte uh, that we uh, call, we term him the Ethiopian eunuch. He is a, assumedly a Gentile from Ethiopia, could be a black man, we're not sure, but we're reminded that the Gospels, we're not sure of the, that is, of the uh, um, color or necessarily completely the ethnic background of this individual, but we do know this, that the Gospel is for all peoples, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and we're headed to the uttermost part of the earth. We look closer at Philip the Evangelist. We're going to see a man whose steps, Psalm 37, are ordered by the Lord. So there's an outline of the eighth chapter there. There's 40 verses in this ch uh, chapter. We've all already seen the uh, ministry of, uh, uh, of Saul in persecuting the church. Philip's ministry in Samaria, and now we're going to look at his ministry in Gaza. Let's start reading in verse number 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. 
And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship. So this is a proselyte. He's not Jewish per se, but he is worshiping the Lord God Jehovah, the God of the Jews, and he takes a trip, a lengthy and expensive trip, to go to Jerusalem to worship. Uh, he is a, a treasurer. Notice he had the charge of all her treasure. So he's probably a well-paid uh, individual. He has the time, has the money to be able to make a trip like this. Well, he was returning and sitting in his chariot, and he read Isaiah or Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near, join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led of the sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest, with all thine heart thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Well, we can see this. We can see this. If there's nothing else that just jumps off the page, we can see, we call him Philip the Evangelist, and he is just do, doing that. He is the evangel is the good news. So the evangelist is the person who distributes or witnesses or preaches the good news. And of course, he preached unto him, verse 35, Jesus. But if you, uh, there's a lot of um, uh, uh, things here, a lot of phrases in this uh, reading here that kind of jump out, some practical things that we could direct our attention to. Uh, two, if we would, for just a moment. Uh, notice uh, in verse number 28, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Maybe this didn't occur to you before, but I mentioned the fact that he was probably a man of means, somewhat wealthy. He had a copy or pieces of the book of Isaiah. He didn't have books back then. So to have a copy a record of the scripture, of even part of a book of the Bible, it took some measure of expense to have that. Well, what he was doing, he had a Bible or a portion of a Bible, and he thought, probably be a good idea if I read it. That's a good idea for all of us, isn't it? Think how many Bibles we have as individuals. I, I would only be guessing at how many I have but I don't think I'd be exaggerating if I said I have 10 Bibles. And that would not include my iPad, which has a Bible program on it. And I can just take my iPad, or I can sit down at my computer, and I can just pick up the Bible right there. I don't even have to have a book, per se, in my hand. Well, here's a man who had a copy of a portion of a book of the Bible, and you know what he did with it? He read it. It was a good idea, wasn't it? Just kind of stuck out, though, the fact that he actually had a portion of Scripture. 
Notice verse 29 says, the Spirit said unto Philip, go near. So, remember what we prayed at the end of our last session. Get up in the morning, put your feet on the floor, but before you stand up, pray and say, God, I want to talk to whoever you want to talk to me, who you want me to talk to today. I want to say what you would have me to say. I want to go where you want me to go. I want you to do what you want me to do today. I just want you to know that the steps of a good man, not that I'm all that good, but I want you to know I believe that my steps can be ordered of you. Pray that prayer before you stand up and then see what happens over the next 10, 12, 16 hours of your day. That would be interesting. Well, anyway, Philip pulls alongside this guy in his chariot. In verse 30, he asks him a question. He says, do you know what you're reading? And uh, the fellow says, you know, I really could use some help along the way. Now, I know that the Spirit leads us into all truth. And I know that I can read my Bible uh, in the privacy of my own home without having a teacher or an instructor there. But I also know this, and I've learned this over the years, and probably one of the reasons why you're sitting in this class, is it's nice to have somebody who's been down the road of Scripture, particular Scriptures, and has some information, maybe some insight, some background, to help me understand what I am reading. I have been blessed over the years to have some great Bible preachers, Bible teachers, some books, some tapes, some videos, conferences, I've had the privilege of being in lots of different venues where someone, where people have been teaching the Bible, and I've learned a lot from others. I haven't learned everything that I've learned, whatever that is, by just sitting down and reading the Scripture myself. I am very appreciative and thankful for other people who have invested or poured their life into mine. Well, anyway, there's a place in the Bible. He was led, uh, verse 32, as a sheep to the slaughter. So he's reading this, and he's got questions about it. And um, uh, the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself? Who's he talking about here? And then it says in verse 35 that Philip said, let me tell you who this is all about. Isaiah is prophesying an individual who would come, his name is Jesus. Now this is a this is a an Ethiopian who has traveled a great distance at great expense to go to Jerusalem and worship. He is a Jewish proselyte. What kind of information or how much information he has about Jesus at this time? Remember, we don't have the internet. We don't have ABC, CBS, Fox, all that stuff. We don't have radio. We don't have even books, magazines, the type of literature and media that we have available to us today. So what he knew, if anything, about Jesus, I really don't know. But he started preaching to him Jesus. That's the goal. The goal isn't to advertise our church. Well, my pastor is a wonderful pastor, and he is. But that's not what the gospel is all about. It's not the building. It's not the personalities. It's not the programs at the church. If you come to our church, we have the best coffee on Sunday morning. That's what we're known for. I hope we're known for more than that. I'm not even sure the coffee's all that good. I never drink it here. Anyway, the fact of the matter is, is when we're preaching, the focal point, the goal, is to bring people to Jesus Christ. Jesus said, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. So that's what it's all about. He preached the gospel. He preached Jesus to him. Well, what doth hinder me? He believed, it says there. He, he believed. And, and, and Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. Now, I know you know this already, but there are many of the newer translations of Scripture that leave verse 37 out. They give us verse 36 and 38, and they leave 37 out based on some manuscript or set of manuscripts or group of manuscripts. 
The fact is, when you leave 37 out and you count 36, 38, you are admitting that something is missing there. Is this a powerful statement, an important statement? What are the qualifications for baptism? Verse 37, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And then what do you believe? What follows is left out also. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. It's left out of many of the new translations. Now, I'm not going to argue um, you know, manuscript evidence here, but it is a glaring omission in my opinion. So anyway, I just needed to note that. You need to note that. He baptized him, it says in verse number 38. And so we've, here's another one of those many passages that deal with salvation. Is this the total story wrapped up in two or three verses? No, not necessarily. We need to have a good, general understanding of what the Bible says about salvation. The list that I gave you that precedes this just a few pages before is a list that will really help you come up with a more thorough or complete formula of what it takes for a person to understand the gospel of Christ. Well, baptism also is an issue that's being dealt with here. It says that baptism followed his decision. So, he trusts Christ as the Son of God in verse 37, and he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they both went down into the water. Now, I will admit you can go down into the water uh, ankle deep or knee deep or waist deep or whatnot like that, but the implication to me is that in verse 39, they were come up out of the water. Now, I can't prove it by that. I know that. But it sounds like that somebody got immersed in the water. And the word baptize means to immerse. So, we believe, I believe, in scriptural New Testament water baptism where the believer, one who has confessed Christ as Savior, is totally immersed in the water as a testimony of their faith and trust in Christ as Savior. They picture Christ crucified as they stand. Then they are buried in the water, under the water. They are picturing the death and burial of Jesus Christ. And then when they are raised by the minister out of the water, they are picturing and symbolizing the resurrection of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15 the gospel. Christ died for our sins. He was buried, and he rose again according to the scriptures. So there's the simple gospel of Jesus Christ, and that's what baptism is a symbol. There are several, the word baptism is used several different ways in scripture. We know that, and um, I don't think in this study that I go into that deeply, but um, um, f- um, I think it's 1 Corinthians chapter 10 talks about the baptism in the wilderness, baptized in a cloud. Uh, Matthew chapter 3 gives us three different baptisms. There's the baptism of John, there's the bapt- let's see, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And there's the baptism of fire. There's three different baptisms in Matthew chapter 3. So check them out. We're talking about Christian water baptism here in Acts chapter number 8. Well, um, we've commented on much of this. Notice they come up out of the water, verse 40, but Philip was found at Azotus and passing through he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. And again, the gospel is moving. It has legs. It's going places. It's not stuck in Jerusalem any longer. And ye shall be witnesses unto me to Jerusalem first, Judea, Samaria, and then to the uttermost part of the earth. The gospel is beginning to move. Now, We've got an Ethiopian 
who has just trusted Christ as Savior, and he is on his way back to Egypt. He is going to be a witness. Maybe, I don't know, maybe the first witness in the country of Egypt at that particular time. I don't really know. doesn't say that for sure, but it's certainly something that we could speculate upon, no doubt. Well, there are several different comments on page 118, page 119, uh, and page 120. We come down to the ministry of Philip, teaches us several things about evangelism. By the way, the lesson, again, just to, as a reminder, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. It's important for you to notice how God is directing uh, Philip through this whole process. He's getting his orders from God. Now, I believe that through the circumstances of life, if we want God to use us and we pray, God, use me today. I want to be a voice. I want to be a witness for Jesus Christ today. Bring somebody's or somebody into my life that I can share the gospel of Jesus Christ with and Make me aware of that. When that takes place, I want to make sure I do not miss it. So I'm asking you, Holy Spirit of God, to impress upon me when that situation arises, when that opportunity avails itself, Lord, I want to be ready to go. I want to be a good witness for Jesus Christ because the steps of a good man, Philip, are ordered by the Lord. Now on page 120, we see the ministry of Philip teaches us several things about evangelism. Faithful obedience, ready to cross cultural barriers. When we think of traditional missions work in the church, oftentimes that's what we think of. We think of going to a foreign country. Remember, God didn't, you know the lines that are on maps? When you look at a map, you see the line between uh, America and Mexico, or America and Canada. <clears throat> we see those lines. God didn't draw those lines. <clears throat> Men have drawn those lines. We put those lines on maps. And they do have a, a functional use. There's no question about that. But God doesn't know boundaries as we know boundaries. Cross-cultural ministry is biblical. We need to be ready to cross cultural barriers. We need to be sensitive we need to start with the seeker's questions. We don't need to start where, you know, with some preconceived idea that we say, listen, I don't know what you need or what you want or what you don't know, but let me tell you what I know. You need to be careful. You need to talk to people and find out what they're looking for. It may save you a lot of time. You don't want to start explaining things <clears throat> that they're not interested in because if they're not interested in them, they're probably not going to learn anything from you. That isn't the question. The Ethiopian had a question. He was reading Isaiah, and he said, what is this all about? I want to know this Philip then started right where he was, and then he spoke to him where he was. He began where the Ethiopian was. Rooted totally in scriptural teaching, Jesus is the theme, one-on-one, -on -one, you're not wasting your time. I know sometimes we think, i got to have a crowd of people to listen to me if, to make it meaningful, one-on-one. -on -one. One on one. I've done more witnessing one on one than any other way. In fact, the first year, year and a half of the ministry, when I was a young man, literally, I went door to door and just told people about Jesus. That's what I did, one to one with whoever answered the door. This is a model of a Christian missionary. Christian missions work is taking the name of Jesus and starting where people are with people's questions to answer them. The big idea is the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Nehemiah is a great illustration example of many things. He's a great prayer warrior. He's a great leader. 
He's an obedient individual. He's a man who made himself available. That may be one of the most important things in the Christian ministry. But he made himself available and knew that the steps of a good man would be ordered by the Lord. By the way, that was written before Nehemiah lived. He, I'm sure he was aware of that passage of Scripture. But at the top of page 121, I want to direct your attention to a, a work that I read several years ago. You can see it was written in 1994, but this is a, this is a great book. And I've kind of just outlined it here on these uh, final pages of the notes of, cha- of this particular chapter in chapter number uh, eight. The name of the book is Experiencing God. Experiencing God is a great, great book. Uh, the subtitle is How to Live the Full Adventure of Knowing and Doing the Will of God. I can't tell you how many times I've been asked in the ministry, uh, what is the will of God? How do I know the will of God for my life? Well, this is probably the best answer. This book and his paradigm, the Blackaby's paradigm of this book, probably the best answer to that question. I've recommended this. I teach this book in my leadership class, and I can personally identify with the seven steps that the Blackabees came up with in the seven realities of experiencing God. God, and this starts general and gets very specific, God is always at work around you, even if you are as dumb as a rock. He is at work around you. Even if you're totally unaware of what's going on around you spiritually, God is at work in your life right now, sitting in that seat, standing in that corner, listening to this tape, watching a video. God is at work around you. And he wants to have a continuing love relationship with you. He loves you. He loved you first. And he hopes that you will love him. He invites you to become part and to be involved in his work. Come on and do what I'm doing. Be part of what I'm part of. God speaks by the Holy Spirit through many different ways, through the Bible, through prayer, through the circumstances of life, and the church, that is, other members and the leadership of the church to reveal himself, his purposes, and his ways. So, How can we get direction? We can get direction from God by reading Scripture. We can look at the circumstances of life around us, what's going on around us. We can spend time in prayer and meditation and asking God for wisdom, guidance, and direction. As I prayed before, ask God to bring somebody into your life today. He'll show you. He will. Then number five, God's invitation for you to work with him always leads you to a crisis of belief that requires faith and action. The more you learn about the Bible and the more God draws you into and makes you, is in the process of making you what he wants you to become, you're going to come to a place where you're going to have to realize that there's some things that you're going to have to get rid of to do what God wants you to do. You're going to begin to disassemble your life. Uh, Illustration, example, Uh, As a young man, I probably tried and played every sport imaginable and uh, enjoyed them. I was never great at anything, but I could could do a lot of things. I played football, I played basketball, I played softball, I played hardball, fast pitch, I played squash and racquetball, I bowled, I played ping pong, I was a long-distance runner, I used to run uh, races, 5Ks and 10Ks, and I tried everything. I was never good, really good at anything. But I just enjoyed competition and and doing something. I found out that as I I got more uh, vested and more involved in my Christian life that many of those things went, in fact, all of them essentially went by the wayside. They're not my priorities in life at my age anymore. I get out and walk. I get some exercise. I do some work around the house. I do things like that. When I was younger, I spent a lot of time in the gym. I spent a lot of time on the road running. Spent a lot of time on my bike. And I'm not, I'm not against all that. Those were good things when I was doing them. But I found as I got older with more responsibility and less energy that I had to focus 
my attention more specifically on fewer things if I wanted to do what God wanted me to do. So I had to, through a crisis of belief, required faith and action. I had to do something about what God was calling me to do. You must make major adjustments in your life to join God in what he is doing. Those were the adjustments, along with others. I left my job, my career at Eastman Kodak Company, way back in the 1970s. I made major adjustments in my life. And you come to know God by experience as you obey him, and he accomplishes his work through you. Never in my wildest imagination would I have ever thought that I would have done for 33 years what I did as a senior pastor in this church. It was not my goal. It was not my purpose. It was not my dream. It was what God wanted me to do. I just believed that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And when opportunity arose, if there were leaders or individuals that believed I could do something, then I took them at that and tried to do my very, very best with the, by the grace and with the strength of God. Philip is an example of a good man who was yielded to the leadership of the Holy Spirit in his life. Although he is exemplary, he is not exceptional. The Lord works in all of our lives in principle in the very same ways. And you can read those bullet points and look at your own life. Can you see God working in this, these ways, experiencing God as the Black of Beast put it? Read that book someday. You'll enjoy it. Because Psalm 37 says that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Let's take a break right here, and we'll pick up next time at the beginning of Acts chapter 9. And we're going to talk about the importance of helping one another, being united, being of one accord. And I start the next lesson, and I'll quote this, and I'll be done. Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him that is alone, and when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. No man is an island. We do need one another. We need God. We need Jesus more than anything in this world. But we do need one another. Churches are groups of people where we come together and we don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. And the, one of the reasons why we do that is because when we come together, we mutually encourage one another in our faith and service for the Lord.